Jaime Maussan created quite the stir when he unveiled what he claimed were alien mummies before the Mexican congressional hearing on UFOs recently. And although I've made a video on this topic already, some more evidence has come to my attention that's caused me to question whether or not I may have got this story right. So in this video, we're going to be taking a detailed look at some of the more compelling evidence that's been presented so far and see what we can make of the story and see if we can finally get to the truth of the matter. All right, so the first stop on this train takes us to the most exalted of trusted news sources, Reddit. A video was posted there of doctors claiming to do a medical examination of the alien alien mummies and what they have to say is pretty compelling so we're going to play the clip in its entirety and we're going to take a deeper look at some of the claims that they're making el primer estudio que se hizo fue una tomografía computarizada el segundo estudio que se hizo fueron placas de rayos x simple y el tercero fue un estudio de fluoroscopía en los tres estudios se trató de ver la estructura el esqueleto de estos cuerpos y se logró determinar que sí pertenece a un esqueleto único, no armado, no armado, de una sola pieza íntegra, que no se observa ninguna especie de armado o de manipulación del cráneo, como lo han dicho. We talk about congruency of joint spaces too as being very important, and that means that it looks like one bone is supposed to fit with another bone, and just focusing on a couple of the specimens here in the shoulders, um, and then what we can see of the hands, it seems to fit that congruency, which again, I think would be, would be very difficult to replicate. Yo he revisado, doctor, las imágenes con reconstrucción 3D tomográficas. Y lo que estoy constatando es que lo que estoy observando es correspondiente a las imágenes con reconstrucción 3D tomográficas. Y no hay ninguna evidencia, sin lugar a dudas, que este cuerpo haya sido armado. Ni adherido, ni mutilado, ni pre ni post mortem. Es completamente normal. Es completamente, completamente no manipulado. Es un ser que ha, vi que ha vivido y este cuerpo tiene preservación de estructuras internas. No tiene un símil a ninguna criatura viva que haya existido en este planeta. Okay, so obviously some pretty wild claims there if any of that is true. And just to summarize, there was no evidence, according to these doctors' examinations, no evidence of any manipulation. This appears to be a single functional organism that was alive at one time. So if any of that's true, that's pretty compelling. But there's also some more evidence that's been presented that is equally as compelling at first glance. And that is the DNA evidence. But before I get into that, these alien mummies were not actually revealed to the world for the first time in 2023. There are actually several of these mummies that have been circulated by Jaime Maussan for several years now. And even back in 2018, Jaime Maussan himself commissioned a DNA analysis of some of the mummies. And we're gonna take a look at that report right now. Now, like all laboratory reports that I've spent an unfortunate amount of time analyzing in my professional life, this is very lengthy, so I'm not going to go through the whole report. I'm going to skip to the conclusion that you're probably most interested in, and that is the DNA breakdown of the alien samples themselves. So there's a couple of things that are relevant here that people are seizing on the internet, kind of ignoring some other important details. So there are three samples here, Ancient 2, 3, and 4. Ancient 2 shows 54% of the DNA sample is unclassified. So here's the part that people on the internet are seizing on, this unclassified part right here. So in the first sample, this is uh, sample 2 and then sample 4, Ancient 2, Ancient 4. So Ancient 2 has 54% of the DNA sample that's unclassified, meaning the sample was too degraded for them to get a clear classification of what the actual DNA was. They didn't, couldn't get a match for 54% of the sample. Ancient 4, that number was 76%. They didn't even bother showing Ancient 3's taxonomic classification breakdown here because Ancient 3, that sample, actually came back that was pretty clearly human. They were able to get a good enough match on the DNA that Ancient 3, one out of the three samples, was actually matched with a human. Now... Here's the other part that people are leaving out. So if you actually look at the taxonomic classifications of the DNA breakdowns, for example, on Ancient 2, this Phaseolus vulgaris, do you want to take a guess at what that is? It's actually a bean. Phaseolus vulgaris is the common bean. So this is a legume. This is not even animal DNA. This is just plant DNA. 20% of this DNA sample was a common bean. And if we take a look down here at Ancient 4 at the other sample, we can see some of the taxonomic classifications that were identified with this DNA sample. 7% was Ovis canadensis canadensis. That's a bighorn sheep. 2% was Bostaurus. 
That's a cow. Now, at first glance, what a lot of people from the internet are saying is that this unclassified 54% and this unclassified 76%, that's the alien part, right? That's the stuff that nobody in science knows what any of that is. It could be completely unknown to Earth, right? But in order to explain that a little bit better, I'm actually gonna pull out of this report and jump into something totally unrelated to aliens or extraterrestrials. And it has to do with the decay rate, the half-life of DNA. Now, this article was published in Nature Magazine back in 2012. So what I can say from my time in academia, although I'm not a published academic myself, I can say that if you got published in a magazine like Nature or Science, those are the cream of the crop scientific peer-reviewed journal articles. They have the best experts in the world reviewing the data carefully. So that's not to say that you don't make mistakes, but when you get published in a magazine like that, your study is probably pretty good. So they took a sample of 158 DNA containing leg bones belonging to three species of extinct giant birds called moa. And these bones were 600 to 8,000 years old. They did an analysis of the ages and degrees of DNA degradation on all of these bones and determined that DNA has a half-life of about 521 years. Now what that means is that if you take a DNA sample of me today alive in 2023, 521 years from now, half of my DNA sample is going to be degraded. It's not going to be easily recognizable as DNA anymore. 521 years after that again, so roughly a thousand years later, 50% of that 50% is going to also be degraded. So what they're saying is 1,000 years after the original live DNA sample is taken, you're only going to have a remaining 25% of the DNA that is undegraded. Now with that information, let's go back to that other report that we just left and see if we can make a little bit more sense of that DNA sample. Now we know from carbon dating of the supposedly alien mummies that these are expected to be somewhere in the range of 700, 1500 years old. So roughly a thousand years old. Now we know that after about a thousand years, DNA has degraded under typical environmental conditions by about 75%. This unclassified portion of 54%, 76%, starts making a lot more sense, doesn't it? You wouldn't expect to get a completely intact DNA sample that's anywhere from 500 to 1500 years old. You would expect it to be largely degraded. So at best, I think what we're able to conclude from the DNA evidence is that it's very inconclusive because it was highly degraded due to age and not being preserved very well. And also there's a very high probability that the samples were highly contaminated from anywhere from the archeological excavation to the handling to the shipping. There's not a great explanation for why 20% of the DNA sample would be from a bean plant other than contamination. Okay, so if we can't rely on the DNA evidence, then all we're truly left with is the morphological analysis of the bodies themselves. And that's that part in that first clip that I played of the doctors examining the body and explaining the congruency in the body parts and how they all fit together. So what do we make of all of that? Does any of that analysis hold up under scrutiny? Now, like the DNA report we just reviewed, and contrary to what's been reported by various sources on the internet, because these mummies have been around for several years, they've already done a detailed morphological analysis. And in 2021, the researchers that did that analysis published a paper applying CT scanning for the identification of a skull of an unknown archaeological find in Peru. Examinations on the found bodies were carried out by a multitude of international specialists on x-rays, scanning, DNA, and radiocarbon C14 analysis in 10 countries across the world. The examination showed that the bodies may be real biological material, and despite all controversy surrounding the case, no evidence of fraud has been established. So that's a pretty important point that they're stating right in the beginning of the paper. They can't find any evidence of fraud and is definitely biological. Despite the controversy surrounding the case, we believe that a serious scientific investigation should have taken place by the responsible Department of Archaeology Peru from the first moment the finds surfaced since this group of bodies were not encountered before and do not resemble any known form. Important information was lost because of the passage of time, the wrong manipulations of the finds, and the rumors circulating around. Okay, so what they're saying here is there was so much mishandling of the bodies themselves, the rumors circulating around the internet about their origins and their potential manipulations that it made it very difficult to do an unbiased scientific observation, which I totally agree with. They should have had somebody do this analysis immediately instead of parading it around the internet for several years. And they show one of the alien bodies here called Josephina. This was just one of the, again, there's multiple samples. There's multiple supposedly alien bodies here. So this is Josephina. There's also Albert, Victoria, and a later edition, Louisa. Okay, so briefly what they've done in this analysis, they've taken a CT scan of the mummies and they've compared them to the brain cases, the skulls of llamas and alpacas because they bear some natural resemblance. 
The first thought that comes to mind is that Josephina's skull thickness was reformed through a physical or chemical process. Decomposition of bone may occur depending on the burial conditions through a chemical process. The same may result if a kind of acid is used purposefully for altering the characteristics of the skull. And you can see here some comparisons between a llama skull and alpaca skull showing how some of these skulls could have been potentially modified. And you can see from the multiple images that are including of the CT scan, they did a pretty detailed analysis from just about every angle comparing this skull from Josephina to those of a llama and an alpaca. And they're saying the only unique feature at this part of Josephina's skull in these images is the mouth plates, which at the resolution of the CT scan available seem to be connected to the skull. So what they're saying is these lips, these lips right here seem to be adhered to the skull based on the CT scan, but they couldn't get a more detailed analysis to see if they were actually adhered to the skull. Could all the above observations prove that Josephina's skull is a unique biological find with anthropomorphic characteristics, or can these be generated or produced in a llama skull? It goes into pretty extensive detail in this paper examining the occipital area, the eyes, the ears. A detailed comparison of the occipital area between the remains of Josephina and a llama branchae shows some similarity in shape. There are, though, areas that are dissimilar. Now, here's where the paper starts getting a little interesting, right? It is observed that an orbital fissure, the passage of the ophthalmic nerve to the brain and an optic canal, the passage of the optic nerve to the brain, can also be found on Josephina, although Josephina's eyes are supposed to be on the opposite side of the skull. They're comparing a llama skull here in this top image to Josephina's skull here in the bottom. Except here, the top image on the llama, this is actually where the eyes are down here. You can't really see it on the image. This is the back of the skull of the llama, except here on Josephine's skull, the morphology is very similar, except the eyes are on the other side. So what they're saying here is it seems like it almost looks like the llama skull was flipped around and the eyes were actually somehow carved out or inserted or used in this cavity right here to create the appearance of eyes, but it's actually the back of the llama skull, not the front. All the above make no sense at the place they are found for Josephina, and this definitely proves that Josephina's skull is an articulated brain case of llama. Still, to further obtain a deeper insight of the whole structure of Josephina's articulation, we examine the articulation of the cranium to the first cervical vertebra. Actually, the fact that the first cervical vertebra enters the basal cranium of Josephina would discourage any serious researcher to investigate further because it would show that the remains were articulated from various bones fitting together in a mechanistic and unfunctional way. The cervical vertebra in Josephina should destroy the brain if there was a downward impact on the head, because in the absence of any visible stopping mechanism, the vertebra would enter the brain case. All right, so what the hell are they talking about here? So in order to explain that, let's take a look at two images. I'm gonna compare images from the CT scan from this mummy, and then a typical human skeletal structure. All right, so in this picture, right here, this is what they're talking about. This is the base of the skull, the basal cranium that they're talking about. Do you see how the cervical vertebra, these vertebra are actually going inside the skull? What they're saying is that if this, there's no way that this could be functional because any downward impact, that spine would shoot right up into the brain and immediately destroy the brain. Whereas if you look at the human cervical vertebra here, that last cervical vertebra is actually sitting outside the skull. It connects to the base of the skull, but it doesn't go inside the brain. It's protected from any of that damage to protect the brain. So what they're saying is functionally, this thing wouldn't be alive very long. There's no way it would have evolved this way because the brain would have been damaged way too frequently by any downward pressure. It would have shoved the spine directly into the brain. Now, I do have to point out the authors of this paper, they do leave the conclusion somewhat open-ended, even though there seems to be compelling evidence that the skull is in fact just a llama skull inserted onto the body of something else. Concerning the remains of the head of Josephina, they are biological in nature. At the available resolution of the CT scanning, no manipulation of Josephina's skull can be detected. The density of the face bones matches very well the density of the rest of the skull. No seams with glues, etc. are obvious, and the whole skull forms one unit. And lastly, the authors state, Based on the above, if one is convinced that the finds constitute a fabrication, one has to admit at the same time that the finds are constructions of very high quality and wonder how these were produced hundreds of years ago based on the carbon-14 test or even today with primitive technology and poor means available to Waqueros, the Tomb Raiders of Peru. So they do leave it open-ended. We don't know where these came from, the authors of the study. They don't know where this came from. They don't know how it was manipulated. They just know that it seems like it was. So... Is any of what we've seen so far compelling evidence that these are, in fact, alien bodies? It's not really looking that way. But there's definitely a lot to be uncovered here. For example, why were these things constructed? Who made them? For what purpose? There's definitely a lot of unanswered questions with these mummies, but that doesn't make them aliens. 
And I've always admittedly been a little confused at the claim that these were aliens to begin with since they were clearly mummified remains from a culture that mummified their remains. It just seemed like they were alien, I guess, from the fact that they had three fingers and kind of looked like aliens. But anyway, that's all I have for you guys in this video. Please let me know what you think about the story in the comments below, and I'll catch you guys on the next one.